Well, thank you for staying tuned to Smart 24 Television, where we believe in smart business. And of course, the show is called Smart Business. My name is Jane Kasumba. I'm ably joined by um, Anthea Ibembe. And Anthea, I know you've had uh, pretty much of a good morning. Um, what do you think your morning is going to look like? And before I bring in Anthea Ibembe into the shot, most importantly, we at Smart Business endeavor to give you all the necessary tips so that you can become smart whilst doing your business. We're all about in allowing you to imbibe business information, be it financial information, so you can make the proper decision when it matters. And the squeeze box below me that you can see right now are the commodity rates as they currently stand. We have market rates, we have forex rates, we have courtesy of the Uganda Stock Exchange, the various indexes as and when they are trading today. So you're most, most welcome to um, Smart24 Television. Auntie Bembe, it's always a pleasure to have you on set. Thank you, Miss Jane. Okay. Um, we're talking about smart business and how it is you can be a smart businessman or woman. Your business tip for today, Anthea? Well, if you had to advise someone this morning yeah. about a business, a smart business tip, what would it be? Um, it's a new year. Take a new step. Take yeah. a bold step and yeah. do what you what you always feared. Oh, you don't have a business, you can start this year. Okay, that's a good one. But most importantly, first and foremost, this program has what they call the market analysis segment. Market analysis segment is very important because we usually take this opportunity most of the time to, to delve deeper into financial matters and business matters that can make you smart. But most importantly, today we're going to talk about Israel and um, agriculture in Israel. And why is it that at the end of the day, a desert country like Israel ends up producing a lot more than maybe what we would produce in Uganda. Tell us about agriculture in, in Israel. Well, agriculture in Israel, it's quite interesting. Um, thank you, Ms. Jane. It's quite interesting because Israel is a desert country. And you'd expect that with only 20% of arable land, you'd expect that agriculture is quite backward. But then it's one of the leading countries with technological developments and research that into agriculture that is actually very dynamic and forward thinking so I think okay. it's something to be looked into. Auntie, I think they always say that uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. Do you think because of um, the history of, of Israel, is that why you think they have such a robust um, agricultural system and other systems as a whole? Because um, I think they had to strive to find a way to feed themselves. I mean, the nation feeds itself it provides for its day-to-day mm. -day, um, because they mainly grow fruits and vegetables and you'd find that a lot of Arabic yeah. countries survive yeah. on that as staple food so the desire and the need actually to survive on those vegetables and fruits necessitates the research that they make into such farming ventures. At this juncture of course we're going to be seeing a lot of pictures coming in from our producer concerning Israel as a country and how it produces and what it looks like. Just tell, how much how much of the GDP in Israel is is represented by agriculture? Well, surprising, it's quite small, but then again it's significant in the in the sense that it isn't expected to be there. It contributes 2.5% to the GDP, but then again we have mm. to recognize that Israel's GDP is mainly brought um, buffed up by yeah. other, uh, other forms of industrialization, forms of, yeah. yeah, other than farming. But then it contributes to point five, which it's decent. It's decent. So now that's where that's what you you, you can you can see on the screens the weather veil, veils in Israel, and of course lots more about agriculture. The main agricultural products that they focus on, um, Antia. That's wheat, sorghum, you have a lot of citrus fruits, yeah. um, vegetables, you have dates, uh, mixed fruits. So they're basically um, your tropical paradise. Yeah, you're, yeah, they made themselves that, I think. Okay, so now you, you, you must be wondering, um, because I know we've done our research, Israel uh, for as a country is in pretty much of a desert um, landscape and that's the same with Egypt but they produce some of the world's best citrus fruits and some of the most in the world yeah. tell us a bit about that um, for citrus fruits for example first of all they need uh, a bit of sun to grow so that works to their advantage so you'll find that where you'd where they'd be stifled in a more damp or tropical setting yeah. they send they tend to thrive in 
uh, the desert countries and that contributes a lot to their staple food. I think they had to adapt to that. So what you're seeing right now, of course, is um, the agricultural outlook of Israel. Like we told you, they, they're into horticulture, they're into wheat, they're into vegetables, they're into um, citrus fruits. Um, what else are they into? Of course, uh, uh, the irrigation system is quite different from maybe what we use. They're into horticulture. Very impressive, huh? Yeah, very impressive. Um, something a wine lover would love to know is that Israel does make a lot of grapes. Yeah. So because they grow a lot of fruits, grapes are not off their radar. They do produce a lot of grapes uh, on the coastal plains mm. and the northern coastal plains because I think that's where the, con the farming conditions are more uh, uh, favorable for, yeah. Yeah, for grapes. So they do make a bit of our wine, yet they don't take Okay. <laughs> what about the fish that you're seeing right there? What is what is uh, the fish production like? Um, well, fishing in Israel is has in the past not been very developed or very. Uh, well, how can I call it? Very advanced. profitable or advanced. Mm -hmm. But lately, they have a system called the Grow Fish Anywhere Advanced System. So, in the Negev um, Desert, there's plans to put up at Fisher Lakes where uh, fishing and fish farming can happen and yeah. contribute a great deal to the GDP. So that's something that's coming up in the in their, in, their, in their plans. Now, we can see, of course, the agriculture that you're seeing right now, be it eggplant, uh, be it uh, grapes, you talked about grapes, but most importantly, um, and their tomatoes as well, most importantly, the irrigation system that they use is quite impressive. It's impressive. And, and, and I know it's similar to the one they use in Egypt. Tell us a bit about that. And it's called the drip irrigation system. So, um, Isn't that the system that the president was trying to, yes. to, to inculcate into people? It's the same one. Yeah, because so tell us a bit about it. Um, you have the irrigation um, plants yes. uh, very low in yeah. the ground, so they provide just a drip and a drip, and it's onto it, just that one part of the plant. Yeah, and it imitates rain. It okay. typically imitates rain. And so psychologically, the plant starts thinking that this is rain. Okay. Yeah, and the rest of the world has quite picked it up. And with the example of Egypt, because for them they had to adapt to it, but other places have used it to ad uh, advance. Okay. So what do you think Ugandan farmers? And you can see, in, there you can see an Israeli farmer explaining the irrigation system, explaining, of course, the horticulture, um, explaining the citrus farms that he has, and explaining the kind of, of agriculture that Israel is based in. Most importantly, what can an African farmer or maybe a Ugandan farmer, and many people are now into farming, yeah. what can they take away from, from the Israelis? Um, I, for one, think we can take away from their resilience. I mean, you are put in basically the one place they said you can't farm. Yes. And they found a way to farm. So that was after their independence in 1948. 1948. They have grown a great deal with the farming. Almost up to today, all over one million acres of Egyptian land is under farming. So if a country like Egypt with those kinds of conditions, mm. unfavorable conditions, if I might, can engage in farming, then surely so can we. And we can take away from the advanced technologies because they're growing at quite a fast rate and to improve our arable land to make even bigger produce because agriculture contributes very greatly to our GDP. Okay, um, do, you, do you farm? Uh, I, I don't. Are you interested in farming? Couldn't even grow a flower. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's so, what's so interesting is that most young people, especially in the African continent, are not interested at all in farming whatsoever. But farming, you might not know this, Anthea, is, is the way of the future. Yeah, it and is. It's, it's important for you to ask your, your parents or whatever to give you um, a small plot of land and then start, start to farm it. Personally, it's I want to start. I want to start cinnamon farming. Um, yeah. uh, my grandparents were telling me about its benefits in over the New Year. Yeah. So you basically grow, plant the cinnamon tree, and in the first three years, you get a kilo of cinnamon leaves. And yeah. when you dry that, yeah, that's twenty thousand at a kilo. Okay. And then in the next, in the next five years, you're getting ten kilos every month is it every day from this same tree so basically if you have a hundred cinnamon trees you can do that so i was looking into it but i haven't yet begun and i, I hope to do it this year okay so we've been looking at uh, agriculture in israel then there you see the harvest from the farms in israel 
tomatoes uh, grown on an Israeli farm, and of course the kind of agriculture that they use and the drip irrigation that they use. So um, Israel, like you talked about, um, they're very famous for what kind of, of, of um, agriculture and what kind of, of foodstuffs? Well, horticulture, um, that's fruits and vegetables. Uh, a lot of the sorghum, the wheat, citrus fruits, avocado, grapes, and what have you. Uh, dates, actually. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention. Dates uh, are famous in Egypt and Israel because they're very sweet. Very conducive yeah. for that weather. Yes. yes. Okay, on that note, we have to take a quick commercial break. And Bebe and I have been talking in our market analysis segment. For those of you who are farmers, and we encourage young people, we encourage young people like you, Anthea. Who will start cinnamon in 2019. <laughs> to start up, um, or to become agriculturalists, start up um, a farm or so, make it a point to, you know what, go out there. And, and, and get a farm, get interested in agriculture, you know, during your summer break or maybe um, if you're a young person and you don't have much to do, um, follow your parents to the farm. Or perhaps if you're a corporate person and you don't know how to invest your money, agriculture is the best place to invest your, your, your money. Personally for me, mm -hmm. I'm into rabbit farming. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, if I had rabbits, I'd name all of them. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> so on that note, we're going for a quick commercial break. We're going to be right back.
Well, thank you for staying tuned to Smart 24 Television, where we believe in smart business. The show is called Smart Business. We give you the tips that you need in order to make that smart business choice and smart business decision. The squeeze buttons on my screen are pretty much pretty clear. Right now, you can see the forex rates. You can see the trading of the market prices as they stand from the cover to a window. And you can also see, of course, um, as it as the squeeze button continues, the various fuel prices and for various forex indexes, as well as, of course. For those of you who are interested in joining us and being part and parcel of us, please make it a point to, to, to certainly join us. And of course, for young people who are watching this show, because we, we like to, to really deal in statistics and percentages. Did you know that 78% or so of the Ghana population is made up of people under the age of 30? And 72% of those are under the age of 25. So we're one of the youngest countries in the world, and certainly one of the youngest in Africa as well. So our aim is to ensure that we inculcate business information, not just to, to those who are adults, but also to you who is a young person, so that you can make that necessary uh, business decision, imbibe financial information, so you can make a change and ensure that you become prosperous. We're tired of people saying, government mutuyambe, something happens, government mutuyambe. You can do something to improve your life today, and the way you can do it is by watching Smart 24 television, where we believe in smart business. Now, my next guest is a gentleman who is a smart businessman. Young man, born in 1977. No, 1997. Very young indeed. The majority of young people are very young, so born in 1997 has already played for the Uganda Cranes. He's a star attacking midfielder for the Uganda Cranes. He's played at some of the best clubs in the world. He has played at Standard Liège and currently plows his trade. He also played in Azerbaijan, currently plows his trade in Croatia, and someday he will be at the Premier League and the La Liga. He's fast, he's quick, he's wealthy, he's a businessman, he's smart. Fruit me as my guest, let's take a look at his story. We'll be right back. As a soccer player, Farouk was born on 26th November 1997 in Uganda. Ugandan professional footballer who is best known for the position of offensive midfielder for the Azerbaijani club Sibel. He is also known for his work on the Uganda national team where he is referred to as Muizi Tasuwa or a hunter who cannot miss. He first began his senior career in 2013 as a player for Vipers. In 2016 he was loaned to the Standard Liège and in 2017 the Royal Excel Muscron. He first played on the Uganda national team in 2014. He was born and raised in Bulo Putambula district, Uganda. He played against Emmanuel Emenike and JJ Okocha when he competed against the Nigerian national team in 2015. In January 2016, it was announced that Mia would be joining Belgian club Standard League in what was reported to be an initial loan deal taking him from Ugandan club Vipers. Standard Liège acquired his services for a fee of 400,000 US dollars. The striker signed with Belgium's Standard Liège Football Club from Viper Sports Club for a fee of 400,000 US dollars, which is approximately 1.3 billion shillings. This by far is the biggest sum of money paid for a Ugandan player. The footballer made 49 appearances, scoring 20 goals for Viper Sports Club since graduating from St. Mary's Chitende Academy during the 2013-14 mid-season transfer period. He was awarded the Uganda Football of the Year accolade last year after a stunning contribution to the club in the Azam Uganda Premier League successful campaign. On 31st January 2017, Mia was loaned to Royal Excel Muscron until the end of the season in February 2018. Mia was loaned to Sabale, returning at the end of 2017 to 18 season.
Um, he's plowed his trade at Vipers in Uganda. He's plowed his trade at Standard Liège in Belgium. He's, he also played at Muscron, yeah. He's also played in Azerbaijan. He's currently plowing his trade in Croatia. He, of course, was bought by um, Standard Liège for 400,000 US dollars, yes. yeah. The biggest transfer fee of a Ugandan player, and it's our pleasure, of course, to have Farouk Mir, who is a great friend of the station here with us. You know, Farouk, you're on Smart Business. Yeah, I am. Pleasure and to be here. The pleasure nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see and you happy too. New Year. Happy New Year to you too, Farouk. Thank you. But most importantly, why you're here as a smart businessman is because we think that you or the people around you, your team around you, have managed your, your career pretty impressively. Just let us know a little about when did this dream for being a footballer start? Actually, thank you, Mr. J, Madam Jane. Yeah. My career, on briefly not, yeah. I started this since I was still young. When you were young? I was still young because... I, I know you were born in 1997, you're a very yeah. young man. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I was encouraged by mom. Yes. But at first she, re she refused me to play football yes. when I was in high school and primarily. Because of the circumstances in Africa, you know, yes. it's difficult to, to play football while going to school. Yes. And it's very risky in, in yes. Uganda especially because there's no facilities, everything. What was what was the what were the conditions like for you um, playing football um, when you were in perhaps prep school, in primary school, and in high school? How would you get away? Would you play at the local uh, pitch? Would you what would you do? Yeah, mostly I used to play with like uh, it's called KKL by then, but yeah. it's called Fourth. Oh, the KKL league. Yeah, but they okay. changed the name of Fourth by the time I went there. It yes. was called Fourth. Yes. By Mr. Tindo, I went through his academy. And many colleagues of mine, like Waisos, and there are many. Yes. We are together, like playing for tournaments. Every holiday, we should we can gather around and go and play a tournament yes. by led by Coach Butindo. Mm. And coming together like that, playing together, mm. my mom got interest and encouraged me to to continue it. Mm. Then I got a chance to go to Chitende then The rest of history. history. Now I I want to know, like, when did your your parents know that you know what? This is not just a joke. We can actually, our son can actually have a career, top flight career in football in Africa. When did you get to know? And of course, some of the pictures you're seeing right now happen to be of Farouk Mir's team, his agents, and him playing in Europe. So just tell us, when did, you, when did your parents know? When did you know that, you know what, this can be a career? Actually, it started when I joined St. Mary's Chitende. Yes. And how was, old were you when you joined St. Mary's Chitende? I was like... 16. You were 16 years yeah. of age. Uh -huh. Yeah, an academy of St. Mary's Tende because they're giving every facilities. Mm -hmm. And my mom saw he, he, she cannot afford that all of the mm. facilities by buying shoes every time. It, this one's torn, I have to get a new one. Mm. Then the president of Viper gave us a chance, he gave me opportunity. Mm. And mom accepted it. And mom accepted it, yeah. yeah. So, what was the opportunity like um, in Chitende? What were they offering you? From Sarah, like. To the bursary and uh, playing in Viper, like it was yeah. my dream coming through, you know. Mm. Coming from small team and going to Viper, Stand Day Academy. Yes. It was like opportunity to open my door to yes. show the world that I can have a talent. It was and an I opportunity can, of a lifetime. Yeah, to when, show when, what I can do. When did you start playing for the Uganda Cranes? When were mm, you? 2014. In 2014, when yeah. you were still with Vipers? Yeah, okay. because I played in Vipers one season and a half. Mm -hmm. I didn't play two, but it was one and a half. Okay. I was someone on the national team then. Others just go to made it to happen. Now, for people who are watching, they might be wondering why Farouk. Now, sport is big business, it's a multi billion dollar business. And if you have the talent, and many African people have the talent, if you see Farouk's build, I know for those of you who are not in studio, Farouk, I don't think you have an ounce of fat on your body. Yeah? So I most know. Africans are pretty much shaped like him. So they, there's, always, there's already an inherent um, talent behind it. So what people like Farouk do is they make that talent into money. Let me fa first ask you, uh, when you were at Vipers, were you being paid anything? Yeah, I was paid, but as you know, for the studies. It was minimal? Yeah, it's minimal. Because I had to do for my transport, everything. Yeah. But because I was staying at home. I didn't demand for much because uh, my mom could afford to give me everything I want. Now, I want so to know I was focusing just playing. You were focusing on just playing? And I knew. When did the big break come? 
after, when, when after did, joining. When did Standard Liège say, this is our man, this is an attacking midfielder that we need? Actually, they have been scouting for a while, yes. but the breakthrough, they accepted when they're playing against Togo, you remember that game, home yes. and away, World Cup qualifications. World Cup qualifications. That is exactly when they, they called and they informed that we need him, he now, needs to come. Let me ask you a question for people who are watching, maybe there's a young person who's watching who wants to perhaps be a football player. How do you know that you've been, you've been um, scouted? Where can you find these scouts? Because there are many Ugandans who are watching and have the talent. Many young Ugandan men have that talent. And they are fast and they, they are talented just like you. But how can they be, how can you be talented? How, how can you be scouted? Actually, about scouting, you cannot be scouted like, the most scout is yourself. Yeah. If you perform very well, all scouts, they'll come looking for you. Mm. Because I didn't know at first, you know, any scout, I would just play my game, enjoying. Mm -hmm. doing my best yeah and they come and they told me that you so people after, are scouting after you the, after the game the yeah. scout approaches you they came even they traveled from belgium to uganda okay even after seeing you play i've seen you play after the game of togo okay and you are being we are going in chan confederation cup mm -hmm. then so when they came and they met me and they told me everything and they met even my my mom yeah and we discussed about me what you interested in your boy and other things I was just shocked, you know, from nowhere and someone's just come and say, hey, and, and, for and, the boys. and the scout had done their homework 100%? 100% because they came knowing everything about me. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe I didn't know their name, I didn't know where they're from. They just said, we know the boy, we have been following up every game he has mm -hmm. been playing. Yeah. And I was really, I saw like this is opportunity I need to take it. Okay, so he had to take that opportunity and the opportunity came in a big way. And the opportunity came from Standard Liège. Standard Liège offered him 400,000 US dollars to move from Viper FC all the way to Standard Liège in Belgium, in Brussels, in Belgium. And most importantly, that was the biggest football transfer of all time for any Ugandan player. How was that like? You offered from out of the blue, Standard Liège. Standard Liège playing, playing of course, they've been at the yeah, Champions League, big, yeah. they've been at Europa. How was that like? At first, I didn't know Standard Liège at all because in Uganda, people are interested in only Premier League, you know. In the Premier League, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Liège, I was, I didn't know the team. Mm -hmm. I went to Google to search to know all history. I saw that yeah. the team was big, he has been in Champions League, they have been in Europa League, they have produced big players, the number. And it was a privilege, I said, you know, I couldn't refuse him to resist. Mm -hmm. So I went direct, I said, you have to meet the president of the club. Then they, they had to, to meet Mr. President Lawrence Mwendo. Then others, I left them with them discussing. For me, I went for Chan. Okay. Rwanda. And that's where you have it. And of course, the Chan Rwanda was very successful for you as well. Yeah. And because I, I just played two games because I got an injury. Yeah. And after then, I left. And that's when Standard Liège said, "This is our man." Yeah. Well, you're seeing the celebratory moves of uh, um, Farouk Mir in Croatia. We're going for a quick commercial break. We're going to be back talking to a smart businessman about how to make smart money using football. Don't go anywhere. Farouk Mia is still with us.
Thank you for staying tuned to Smart 24 Television, where we believe in smart business. The show is called Smart Business. We invite um, our guests who happen to be smart businessmen or smart business women. And today we're talking about sport and the fact that you as a young person can certainly get all that you need at the end of the day from just being smart. And of course in studio with me is none other than Farouk Mir. Farouk Mir is an attacking midfielder for the official national team. That's the Uganda Cranes here in Uganda. Better still plows his trade in Croatia. He has been in Azerbaijan He's played for Standard Liège in, of course, um, Belgium. But his future is extraordinarily bright. His transfer fee, 400,000 US dollars, was the biggest transfer fee for a young player in Uganda's history. And what a history it has been for Farouk Mia, born in 1997. And today he stands tall as a gentleman who's representing Uganda in Europe and certainly, certainly has a bright future. And there you can see him in action. But Farouk, if I can come over to you most importantly, I want to know, yeah, what are your best moments in football? If you have to look back, yeah, yeah. I know you're dancing there, you scored a goal there, but what were your, what has been your best moment in football? Give me two. My best moments yeah. is when we qualified for AFCON. When you qualified for the Africa Af Cup of Nations? After all that long time. After, because Uganda was last in the Africa Cup of Nations in 1978, yeah. and I think it was in 2016, is it? 2016. 2016, the jinx was broken, and this man, Farouk Mir, happened to be right there and happened to be in the heart of it, qualifying for AFCON after almost 30 years or so. Yeah, yeah. Your take on that on that evening, what happened? And was it a good game for you? Yeah. It was a good game because we won and we qualified yeah. because our target was to qualify, yes. no matter how, but you had to, had to qualify. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, the most moment is when I, it's me who scored it. I feel like... I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, you're the one who scored the goal. Exactly. Let me ask you a question. Um, how do you handle the pressure? Because you went, in the, you went onto the pitch, everybody was talking about Farouk Mir. We're talking about attacking midfielder Farouk Mir. He's, a, he's going to be the change agent. Mm -hmm. And you, it, you did it. How do you remain calm, cool, and collected? And how do you deliver results? Actually, when most of the time when I'm entering the pitch, I don't even think about the fans, first of all. Yes. I just focus about the pitch, what is happening on the pitch. I just play my game, I say, I go on the pitch, I praise the God, I say, you're giving me another opportunity. Mm -hmm. I just start to deliver, do my best, just so that I give my best on the pitch and others happens next. So that was an exciting moment for you. And of course you can see Farouk Mir, he's circling there, the ball is provided to him, that's Farouk, right in the midfield. Now watch how he's moving, he's moving right into the D. And you, you always know how to get the opportunities, you always know how to be free. You are really a deadly, deadly player. Yeah, actually I think it's about mental and you know, basics of football, you know. Mm -hmm. Start from a young age, if you have, you've been in academy, yeah. By now, these things just just happening right now. I've gone through the drills in fourth, you know, yeah. so that now it's just happening. It becomes easier for me. Yeah. I know what to do next. You, you know, know how, how to, to stand. Yeah. You know, it's just basically of academy. That's why you have to go through drills when you're still young. That's why they call it academy. Are you are you a selfish player? Are you looking for glory? Do you do you like to share the ball with your teammates? 
Of course, I have to. I like sharing. You, 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 you I, pro, pro, I you prefer provide. both. I like scoring and I like assisting. Okay. But sometimes it doesn't come to. It doesn't come. <laughs> most of the time, I score. I like I find myself in a good position of scoring most of the time. Okay. Now, Farouk, you told me one of your most memorable times in football. Mm. That was 2016 when yeah. Uganda but, qualified for the Afcon mm. and you scored. Yeah. What is your second most memorable moment in football? Most moments. It's when my life was changed since I went to Europe. It's an early age. Your life changed. In changed standard. completely. How did your life change? I mean, I know you come. You're, I changed You're a young everything. man from Butambala, from um, Bulo, Butambala, right? No, Butambala, not by but origins from Butaleja, Istanbul. Butaleja, yeah. yeah. And from Butaleja, as a young man, yeah, yeah. did you ever dream you'd be playing at Standard Liège? You'd be playing top flight football in in Europe. I had a dream of playing on top. Being a professional player yes. in a big club, but I didn't think it would start. I would start with the Standard Liège yes. because Standard Liège was a big team. Starting yeah. from Uganda direct to to Europe, mm. it was really a surprise and a shocking to me. It was a really news I couldn't believe. How and did your life change? Actually, like my life changed in everything. The thinking, the approaching. Tell me how you changed in, in in your thinking. When I went there, I was alone. It's like I've gone in no man's land, you know. No one knows you, you have so to work. You work hard for it. For everything. It's not like, yeah, I, I can play, knowing my mother will come and support me, my friends will come. But there it was like, you are alone. You have just to deliver. Then and you had to bring your A game every single day. Every game you have to deliver. Even in training, it's like a game. You have to perform. Without fail. Not fail. You have to be at work on time. Everything's about time. It's really, it was really my first experience and everything changed time management time. in europe is very important in football let's time. talk about money yeah. How, did you become prosperous when you became a professional footballer yeah it was like business football has changed completely now it's a billion money yes. it can change people's life in a seconds I, I think that's important for you to state it's that very, football very is a multi-billion dollar, dollar industry that's be it whether really you work in, in merchandising, be it whether you are the player on the pitch, be it whether you are the broadcaster. broadcaster. It's 360, it's about money. Money. So your life changed? It changed completely. And how have you invested your money? Have you been smart? I'm, I'm always smart. <laughs> and that's why, by the way, uh, for I'm those of you who do not know, that's why we invited uh, Farouk Mir here today because we believe he's a smart businessman. Born in 1997, you do the maths of how young this young gentleman is. But most importantly, at the end of the day, you are able to already have what many people in your age group don't even have. Yeah? Yeah. So are you a good saver? Yeah, After I like saving. Er starting earning all these dollars and pounds, you decided to, 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 to save. Yeah, in my country especially, not outside. And that's what I like most. He's talking about the fact that after he made some money, he decided to invest back in his country. Why do you think that is very important? And you're still playing active football. Why did you think it? Because most I player, most football players actually don't care much. Um, yeah. They live their life, spend the money, are lavish. Why would you invest back in your own country? Why would you invest back in Uganda? Because it's where I came from. And I wanted like to inspire some players, you know, yeah. the young generation, you know. To, to believe that anything can happen, mm. everything is possible. Mm. Because if I can do it, someone else down also can do it. My age means, my colleagues, yeah. that whatever he's doing, he can make it also mm. to where I am, even more than where I am. Just to be, believe in yourself and you can do it. And you can do it. Yeah. Now, tell us a bit about the team that surrounds you. You know, when you become a professional a football player, yeah. and I know even when, when I had to contact you, I had to go to your PA, your yeah. PR person, yeah. your agent. Tell us about the people who surround you as a football, professional football player. Yeah, actually, my agents, it's called a sports bar. Yeah. And I'm really happy to work with them, and I'm yeah. really happy. Whatever they have reached me today, they have taught me a lot. So they groom through. you as a player? Yeah, even off the pitch, the things which we have to go through, whatever yes. I've managed, I'm really happy whatever they are doing. They know their self, whatever they are, yeah. Nicholas, they know. For I people, think people know, people know, they yeah. read about them, yeah. For people who might not know, a, a player, when you become a professional player, you don't just move on your own, you have to have your agent, you have to have your PR person, you have to have your fitness, you have an, a personal trainer. Yeah, you do have. A personal trainer, everything, to make sure that you're ship shop and fit. It's, it must be hard playing in Europe. You, yes, you played in the qualifying rounds of UEFA Champions League. Yeah, yeah. The level is very high. Tell us a bit yeah, about that. 
because they are everyone works you know there's no one relaxing at everyone is doing his best everyone, everyone is best. doing they, people invest in football players invest someone gets in a personal trainer mm. someone wake up every day got someone who will cook for him yeah. that uh, so that he can deliver that he can do the best on the pitch without because fail the Ronaldo we see the misses it's a very long way it's a long it's way. not a miracle they are there so tell us a bit for example when you wake up maybe at your club yeah. what do you do how do you keep yourself in such unbelievable shape mm. how do you keep yourself fit enough to play for the first team every time for the Uganda Cranes for most of time my me personally yeah I like it train three times a day you train three times a day yeah. for how long it depends the time the kind of training I can I can I train in my room at home I train in a compound then after I train alone with the club then after I go back I train alone you late train at alone. night yeah. and what do you eat because that's also very important most of the time I eat like things which are light like most of the time is salad mix so, so take, us mix. Through, take us for breakfast what would Farouk Mia have breakfast most yes. of the time I take juice I just I juice. buy I buy my juice and I I mix up no orange sugar. with honey most of the time not With sugar. honey yeah. not, sugar. not sugar so you blend all these yeah, I took my honey from here the real honey not real, buying real not processed honey, honey. no so so you actually go with your own honey yeah so you process the, the meat I mean you you process the I mean you do you, you shred the juice yeah yeah and, and that's what you have every morning I take every morning it. yeah how many glasses one glass I take one glass big glass not really big but medium I medium take it glass. because I know I'm going for training yeah then after training that's when I have to eat well okay really. after after okay so you have your glass of juice yeah. you go for training yeah. what happens when you what what do you have for breakfast after the training after the training mm. that's when I have a little bit heavy breakfast yes like what, is, what take, is heavy I breakfast? take a meal like around the noon not category <laughs> I can take like a salmon with mixed with pasta. Okay, uh, salmon mixed with pasta. Yeah. You know they say that pasta is very good for football players. Yeah, spaghetti. It's more so, every game you have to eat pasta when you're going for a game. Why? Because it's it's easy to uh, to digest digest in the stomach. Okay. Because when you eat a lot of food, when you're going to pitch, it will take like an hour to digest, and you'll be heavy on the pitch. You cannot feel yourself. You cannot run. Okay. And but people will not understand it outside. Oh. But people, oh, that's why you have doctors and. That's a very People good taking, tip. Yeah, then what about mid morning? Do you have anything to eat at mid morning? Not normally. I don't eat in mid morning. What about afternoon? Afternoon I do eat. What do you eat? I eat more like pasta. A, most of the time is rice pasta. Rice and pasta. Yeah, things which you can digest easily. And then in the evening? In the evening I take most of the time I take salad myself. Salad. I prepare. I prepare my kettle, I can prepare my carrot, I, I mix it by myself, you know. When I'm lazy, somehow lazy, I go I buy it when it's already prepared and then I take. And then you take it. Yeah. So let's look at the lifestyles of um, really the rich and famous footballers. Who is your favorite football player? My favorite player. Football player. It would be Ronaldo. Cristiano Ronaldo. I have my reason why I like him. Why do you like him? I like him because he's, he's a hard-working man, really. Yeah, he's a very, very hard-working hard hard man. man. But yeah. have you ever thought about how much some of these players are, play, are paid? Because Cristiano Ronaldo has paid almost a hundred thousand U.S. dollars, no, a hundred thousand pounds yeah. per week. Yeah, so the richest, one of the richest players. In the one world. of the richest players, and that is your favorite player. Who else yeah. do you consider as one of the greatest players of all time? Of all time, to me, I'm seeing. I think yeah. there are many. There's Ronaldinho. There was Ronaldinho, Ronaldinho yes. yes. Of course, that's when he was really a magician. And who else? There are some players whom I like, like individual, because they do what I can do, what I prefer. Yes. Like hazards. Mm. There are many players who I know. Yeah. I like the way they play because I know I can do what they are doing. Mm. I, I watch most, most of the time them. I don't watch games. No. no. I don't watch all games. Yes. But I watch players whom I know I can do, I can admire. That you can I can admire. learn. I can learn something from them. Very good. And of course, what you're seeing right now are some of the games. Um, I think that's the UEFA Champions League game. And of course, you've also played at a qualifying um, yeah, yeah. Um, Europa League. Yeah. Europa League. Yeah. Um, and um, that you were the first Ugandan to do that um, yeah, after Sekaja. Yes, I think I yeah. yes, after Sekaja. But most importantly, as we part, for someone who's watching today, they want to become a football professional football player. Yeah. What would you tell them? Uh, the first I can tell someone, anyone who is trying, who wants to become a professional footballer, is just to have to be disciplined and keep focus. Just dream, believe. Believe. To have to believe and faith, you can do it. You can do it. Yeah. Okay. And most importantly, it's also very important for you to remain, like he said, focused and to make sure that you believe. And okay, um, Farouk, after football, 
what would you want to be? Would you want to be a coach? I'm not really sure. I haven't thought about becoming a coach yet because it's very hard to become a coach. It's very hard to become. It's difficult. You wouldn't want to be like most of the, most of you the wouldn't want to be like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. You wouldn't want to be like Zinedine Zidane. You don't see most of the percentage of players after football becoming coach. Most it's difficult. It's, that is another thing, another. It's another profession. Profession altogether. Sometimes luck because you saw Zindani came just one year from the coach and he, he took six trophies with Madrid. Yeah. Others they've spent 30 years. Yeah. They have gone studying professional coaching, but nothing happened. Nothing happened. So yeah. sometimes it's luck and and I think it will depend. I don't know. I will change maybe coach, maybe a administrator. I don't know. But yeah, you will, I have to have to solve main, something to in football. Yeah, I will have to some. Not I will do both. I will have to some something up in football. Okay. For the young generation. So. For the young generation. Yeah, to inspire. Most of them. Thank you, Farouk Mia. Thank you, Tom. You are an inspiration without a doubt. Farouk Mia is, of course, one of the leading attacking midfielders from Uganda, and he's currently plowing his trade in Europe. Your your favorite team that you'd like to finally play for. If your if your if your agent told you Farouk, which yeah. team would you like to be in? Would you like to play for? And what position? I would say Real Madrid. Real Madrid? Yeah. What position? Attacking midfielder, sir. Attacking midfielder. On that note, we have to bid you adieu, Farouk <laughs> Mia. We'll be leaving our mm -hmm. studios. The show Smart Business continues in Rimbalex. Like, like what Farouk said, as a young person or as a business person, or if you're watching this program today, the two components of being successful and carrying out smart business, be focused and be disciplined. Thank you for watching. We'll be right back.
Thank you for staying tuned to Smart 24 Television, where we believe in smart business. And of course, for those of you who've been joining us, our profile was, of course, of Farouk Mia. Farouk Mia was with us uh, for a few, 40 minutes or so, and we got to the nitty gritty of what it means to be a businessman in football. Did you learn anything from Farouk, by the way? I didn't know about him until today, and, t and I watched you guys. I yeah. was like, he's quite inspirational. He is, huh? Yeah. He's pretty much like your age. My age, 21, yeah. and he has made that much of himself. So it, it's nice to be recognized where, when what you do is yeah. that involving. Valued at over 400,000 US dollars at that age. It's a big age. Yeah. A, a, a big amount of money for a very young age. It's Many people for, don't get exposed to that until they're later. The, yeah. Well, Anthea Bembe and myself are still in the studio with you. Today we're going to take you through the commodity prices, uh, the markets and uh, the fuel rates and the bus fares. We're going to have them on your screens shortly. Anthea will be able to take us through, through all of that. Did you go to the market yesterday? I was very exhausted. You were very <laughs> Between research and uh, classes and going, get, getting home, yeah. I was extremely exhausted. I didn't go to the market, but then I'm ready to tell and Analyze. know what's in the market yet today. okay so we're going to get through the the markets um to you shortly as they appear on your screens but most importantly i'd like to just again um ask you to take a look at this bar right be right across yeah that of course is the trading rates at this particular moment the usc the the sequel the dfc eabl e ebl and JHL and how you're trading that was previous in Uganda shillings and current in Uganda shillings. They're staying pretty much constant and what of course affects the stock market exchange is pretty much a lot of things. Um, the stability, economic, social issues and right now pretty much the prices are being um, pretty much um, stable as they stand. And our commodity rates, we showed them to you yesterday and what we're getting from, our, from the field is that it remains pretty much the same. How important is it for people to get this information, Anthea? Um, it helps them to make uh, the most informed decisions yeah. when shopping and when carrying out their day-to-day -day lives because you never know which market you go to. As yesterday we could see, um, I think Nakasero was the highest priced market on each particular commodity. So it helps you to make certain um, decisions. You're like, all right, I will choose to go to probably Kalere or, oh, you know, which was actually the cheapest. So it helps you to plan your day systematically so you can save a coin. So that you can indeed save a coin and that's why we have smart business, that's why we have this show. Our job is to make sure that you get all the best rates possible to make that decision. In the market today, Calero stands at, that is 22,000 for Matoke. That is the cheapest yet, isn't it? It is, it is. And you know, growing up, I didn't know Matoke was that expensive because growing up it was like 10, maximum 15 the last time I started yeah. going, I stopped going to the market. So. 22 is quite the margin, that's like 7,000 yeah. more. Or but actually, um, the going rate sometimes can go until around 35,000 to 40,000. Yeah, for a bunch, depending on, on the size and depending on the place. Exotic chicken this morning, Anthea, is at 30, 13,000 Uganda shillings. Local chicken is at 25,000 Uganda shillings. You can see the, the, the difference. Still impressive, yeah. Yeah, the difference between 13,000 to 25,000. Exotic eggs at 12,000. Local eggs at 20,000. Meat at 11,000. Honey at 13,000. Turkey at 75,000 and tilapia at 15,000. Your take on, on fish, um, tilapia, um, do you eat a lot of fish? Um, I'm honestly more of a chicken and pork person, but yeah. yes, when availed with fish, I do eat fish. You do eat fish. Well, there you have it. If you're going to buy a kilo from Calario Market, that's pre or pork oh, fish. A particular yeah. fish. Yeah, a particular fish. Today we, we are taking a look at um, tilapia. And of course, whenever we show you one market, that means that that is the only market that we felt had the best prices or the best rates. And of course, these rates keep on fluctuating. And this is, of course, Nakasera. Let's go back to Matoke. Remember, um, Kaleri, Matoke was 20 22. Now this at, uh, at uh, Nakasero Market is 35,000. And sometimes, like I told you, it's about the location and the size of, of, of the, 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 the Matoke itself. Yeah, Take that us bunch. through all the other prices. Um, so we have the exotic chicken at 13,000. The yeah. local Kaleri chicken. Kaleri was at 12,000. Yeah. yeah. So there's that disparency. And that's yeah. why I said it helps you save a coin or two. 
and you know when you look at these markets in terms of proximity they aren't so far apart probably uh, five or seven kilometers mm -hmm. but then it matters if you're buying in wholesale for example if you have a restaurant or yeah. something of the sort it really such a margin matters mm -hmm. so um, if you could just give us back the rates so I could read from the local chicken on one so, uh, lo local chicken was around um, well that's 30,000 Ugandan shillings. Yes, 30. yeah, 30,000 Ugandan shillings. Quite high, isn't it's it? It's quite high. And I, I'm, because honestly, for now, I'm thinking about the people who have a restaurant or an establishment for eating. Mm -hmm. If you're going to spice that chicken and then sell it back, people wouldn't understand why you're selling your food very highly. Mm -hmm. So you're better off going to a cheaper market, not to the market actually, but you're better off going where it's more affordable actually, so that you can make the highest profits. If we could get the rates back, please. And of course, again, um, you saw the turkey was at, here at, Nak at Nakasero Market at 85,000 Uganda shillings, and before at Kaleri yeah. it was 75,000, difference of 10,000 Uganda 10, shillings. Your take on that? Do people, do a lot of people, of people eat turkey in Uganda? I had turkey on Christmas, Okay. Uh, but I don't think a lot of people insist on turkey i think yes. they're like ah, what i can get from turkey i can get from, from chicken. chicken so they're like ah, why why spend all that but then again turkey has its advantages because it's quite huge mm. so if you have a, a big family yeah you're doing great and then here we have the local eggs a tray at twenty five thousand. Mm. And then the tilapia at fifteen thousand, and the processed honey quite dipping from yesterday where yes. it was fifteen. Today it's twelve thousand, and the beef at ten thousand. And yesterday the beef I remember was eleven thousand. So yeah, that's something we can uh, appreciate. Mm. I mean, this is more favorable for anybody with an establishment or traders. Um, personally, I think Nakasero is the highest market we. As the priciest market we analyze, mm. and and the rates remain kind of pretty much standard. Pretty much standard, with a difference of one thousand, two thousand, and up to like four thousand, but nothing that drastic. Okay, so we're going to have the the transport fares shortly, but before we get to the transport fares, Nakao market standing at thirty thousand. That's Matoke. A little slightly um, cheaper than uh, Nakasero, but still high. Exotic chicken at 13,000, local chicken at 24,000, exotic eggs at 10,500, and local eggs at 30,000. Uh, 30, What's the difference between local eggs and exotic eggs? To be honest, Miss Jane, I think it's the nutritious value. Yeah. Um, I think local eggs offer you way more, and the people who grow them, sorry, the people who rear them know that, so they, they would hike the prices. It's like, as we had said in yesterday's show, um, how you may have uh, food that has GMOs, it might be cheaper because, sorry, it might be more affordable, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. It might be more affordable, but then when you go in for the food that's organically grown, it's, it might be slightly price, yeah. a bit expensive. So, so they know the value of the nutrition So that's offering. pretty much what Nakao market looks like um, this morning. Just remember that we try to get you all the different uh, market rates so that you can make that decision at home. That's why we ask you kindly, make sure that when you are watching this station or when you're watching um, this show, make sure that you have one of these, an iPad, or better still have a notepad where you're writing things down or perhaps you can record the program that you're watching so that you can get all the best rates even saving that 1,000 Uganda shillings matters and yes. this in, in the spirit of saving this takes us back to the market analysis we did earlier we encourage people to farm and this brings it back to this if somebody can grow their own matoke which is not actually very hard to grow yes. if somebody can raise rear their own chicken if somebody can do their own maize you actually and cut on pass and yeah. yeah you cut on going to the markets i know a lot of people that have farms that provide for them and their communities so again i, I think the farming part is important it's very important indeed and we're going to get the rates the bus rates um um, shortly, and there we have it, Chisora to Kampala, pretty much remaining the same standard. Chisora, very, have you been to Chisora? No, but I'm told it's very beautiful. It's Most very beautiful, very cold, there, yeah. and it's very far. So <laughs> 70,000. Seven Uganda. hours, they say? Yeah. yeah. Pa, seven to nine, nine hours, depending yeah. how you're driving. 70,000 Uganda shilling. Barara to Kampala. Have you been to Mbarara? No, neither. You haven't? I haven't. 70,000 Uganda shillings. Either. Bar is quite nice. Yeah. Like front, four, four, four hours. Yeah. Guru to Kampala, 30,000 Uganda shillings. Have you been to Guru? Neither. Uh, 
you, I need to encourage Ugandan people to, to go out of I haven't houses. been anywhere. You haven't been anywhere. <laughs> but it's very important. Gulu, very bustling town and yeah, city. Yeah. Quite expensive, but very nice. Really? Good weather and yeah. good food. At 35,000 Ugandan shillings. Have you been to Mbali? I haven't. Done. You haven't been to Mbali? I haven't Mbali, been anywhere. To get to Mbali is 25,000 Ugandan shillings. Quite far, actually, around, you know, you catch that Tirinyi Road. Goes on forever. It takes you like four, four, five hours. And but then, it's a beautiful, beautiful town. I'm, I'm wondering if it's quite far. Then why is Kisoro further? Is it because of the no, terrain? No, no, no. Terrain, terrain and Kisoro is much further. It's much, much further than than Bali. All right. Yeah, I see. yeah. And so of course, a lot has got to do with terrain. And remember, these are just one way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you have to double it to get a return. Oh, a return yeah. here. So it remains pretty much steady. The, the rates are, of course coming down as people of course most people have come back um, for the from the New Year's festivities and from Christmas festivities so Kampala is pretty much packed and that's pretty much the without way. five million on a daily yes <laughs> without five million on a daily <laughs> on that note we're going for a quick commercial break we're going to be right back Athi and Bembe and myself are still in studio
Thank you for staying tuned to Smart 24 Television, where, of course, we believe in smart business. It's not by chance that this show is called Smart Business. <laughs> it's because we give you all the necessary smart business tips that you need. And you can also um, watch the scrolls um, and the squeeze box on your screen currently as a commodity rates, forex rates, all of that changes. Um, of course, we profile very important people so that you can learn something from them. Our business profile today was Farouk Mia, and we also, also profile those in lifestyle, see how much they are worth, and a lot of perhaps maybe what they've done, what they've taken on as a career. Today we're profiling a young lady from Nigeria. Yes. Her name, Anthea? Emanuela. She's a child comedian. Yeah. Um, I think she parodies a lot of real life situations yeah. and she's and quite the living and the fame. And she's an internet success. Um, most times in your chat rooms on WhatsApp and other social media, you'll see her videos come in and go around. So I think Emanuela is quite the Nigerian childhood success. Well, she's valued at over a hundred thousand US dollars, and this is her indelible story. An ignorant man. Well, her net worth speaks volumes too. This icon has many now. What is the opposite of front? Manala, back, back for Christ's sake. Okay. Averting the influence and significant contribution of a noble Nigerian actress and comedian Emanuela Samuel in the history and existence of the Nigerian entertainment industry looks like a mistake of an ignorant man. Well, her net worth speaks volumes too. This icon, as many Nigerians well know, has recorded a long list of short comedies, movies, and other short video clips. Tremendously, she is one of the most famous actresses, calm comedy that speaks children and adults alike of their balance. Life itself is, and at times, it becomes practically unfair, but what, irrespective of that, born geniuses will always drive their way out. Before her fame, she was featuring in Mark Angel's comedy and making some of other funny videos while living with a Mark Angel's as a cousin. Until she had her first hit, it had indeed been significant work on both her part and that of Mark Angel. Having tons of videos on YouTube and other video sharing avenues, the duo's joint efforts and video collaborations kept the fame alive. Emanuela, as fondly called, has left footprints in the sands of time. What more can a random child ask from a media and video if not for my real face? The little girl has made exploits with the excellent assistance of Mark Angel, who groomed her in every ramification. Being a swift learner, she fitted into the train and began to make waves. In many homes, parents win their children's hearts and get what they want if they tease them with this prominent girl. Today, Emanuela is a household name in the Nigerian entertainment and movie industry. It is as if Emanuela Samuel's net worth is inestimable because she is everywhere. However, everyone has a net worth. Isn't it? What could be Emanuela Samuel's worth in cash? Before discussing the star's monetary worth, let's look at her narrow path to the top ranks of the Nigerian entertainment industry. Before discussing the star's monetary worth, let's look at her narrow path to the top ranks of the Nigerian entertainment industry. Currently, the Nigerian born comedian and actor is worth approximately 70,000 US dollars, that is 25 million naira, in 2018. Many would think 70,000 US dollars is entirely too much for an eight year old to have as her net worth. But as a star and as a leading comedian in Nigeria, it's not strange. With the signing of the movie deal with Walt Disney of Hollywood and with all channels of income still earning her cool cash, the young star's net worth is expected to increase with her age. Mr. Principal, I cannot pay 200,000 as coffees for this chickly girl. Mr. Mark Angel, this coffee is 200,000 naira and it's not negotiable. But principal, why? Remove Siarike. Hmm? I go to judge. <laughs> Remove music. I like comedy. Mm -hmm. Remove handwriting. My handwriting is fine. Remove quantitative. Who do I help?
And there you have it, Manuela, valued at over 100,000 US dollars, and she's so young, eight years of age. Um, comedy is becoming quite lucrative, isn't it? Andrea? It is. We, yeah. see a, we see a lot of Ugandan stand up comedians yeah. and even the ones who use it. I think the internet has been quite useful. And in Uganda, there's this particular event called the Comedy Store. Have you heard of it, Mr. Yes, I have. Uh, where Ugandans who enjoy comedy go yeah. to, and it's a really huge event. So I think comedy is big in the entertainment business. And in the world western world yeah they have a lot of sitcoms and actual yeah. also stand up it's so very it's established a viable form of entertainment now and a very contributive one in terms of economic uh, generation okay so there you have it and finally as we wrap up of course uh, because we usually are out of here at the top of the hour but most importantly we w wouldn't want to leave you without um, you know um, looking at your health and we, um, Anthea, myself and of course the ladies and gentlemen of Smart24 believe that in order to have a smart business you must be in smart ship shop shape and smart health. And what are we looking at today, Anthea? Um, today we are looking at stomach ulcers which is a form of um digest of peptic ulcers yes, peptic ulcer yeah where your digestive acids eat up uh, your your intestine your stomach walls yeah. and kind of cause an ulcer so yeah. it's quite painful and most times you'll find that the symptoms are uh, heartburn um, loss of appetite a feeling like you don't need to eat very often yeah. and just generally dif discomfort right under your heart is yeah. yeah the stomach is right under the heart so, so you have that burning sensation yes like you can see on the screen and of course that's pretty much what Anthe has been describing so um it's pretty it's it's a burning of the of the stomach lining yeah technically it's uh yeah by the acids in the stomach and yeah. it gets pretty uncomfortable and in its extremes it can even be deadly oh, okay. so many people will have to have surgery when it gets very extreme and you know there's ways you can curb it uh, now you see technically that acid works upon the stomach wall yeah, yeah and eats it up and causes such such discomfort and uh, it's aggravated i think uh, okay. sorry um by eating acidic foods, foods yeah pineapples matoke yeah even mangoes for some people who have very fragile stomachs yeah. and their body can't resist those acids so yeah so of course uh, most importantly um people must we must tell our viewers what can they eat if they can't eat those acidic, acidic foods well i for one don't suffer from ulcers but i've lived around very many people who suffer from them so i know that the quickest remedy is warm milk Oh. very gentle on the stomach walls so you just put in some warm milk and that should do um, also very soft things like bananas so you have the roughages things that don't require such uh, corrosion to digest they tend to be quite easy when you have stomach ulcers and they they soothe you of okay. course plus uh, there's medicine for it but the most natural a remedy is warm milk so the best uh, remedy is warm milk and there you can see of course um, the of course the, how the process of how one gets a peptic ulcer and how it's built in the, uh, the the lining of of the stomach and that's a gastric ulcer now treatment for the peptic ulcer is what we're talking about right now because at smart 24 we believe in smart uh, business translates smart health translates to smart business so antibiotics to kill the h pylori to stop or limit use of NSAIDS, proton pump inhibitor, which is a PPI for gastric ulcer, and H2 blocker for duodenal ulcer. So there are different forms of, of treatments for the peptic ulcer, and of, of course protective medications while healing. These are the following. A peptic ulcer is a sore that develops in the lining of the lower part of your esophagus or various parts of your stomach or small intestine. A peptic ulcer in your esophagus is called an esophageal ulcer. In your stomach, it is called a gastric ulcer. When the ulcer affects the first part of your small intestine, called the duodenum, it is called a duodenal ulcer. When you eat, your stomach produces highly acidic digestive juices, also known as stomach acid, to help break down food.
Then the food passes into your duodenum for further digestion and subsequent absorption into the bloodstream. To protect your organs from the corrosive effects of stomach acid, a layer of mucus coats the lining of your stomach and duodenum. When the protective mucus layer breaks down, stomach acid can seep into the lining of your stomach or duodenum and cause an ulcer. Most peptic ulcers are caused by the bacteria Helicobacter pylori, also known as H. pylori. Scientists think these bacteria may enter your body through contaminated food or water, or through close contact with an infected person. Once inside your body, they lodge in the mucus layer of your stomach or duodenum. As the bacteria grow, they damage the mucus layer, allowing stomach acid to reach the stomach or duodenal lining. Together, the bacteria and stomach acid cause an ulcer. Some peptic ulcers are linked to heavy usage of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, also known as NSAIDs, including aspirin and ibuprofen. These drugs reduce the ability of your stomach and duodenum to protect themselves from the effects of stomach acid. Your doctor may prescribe one or a combination of drugs to treat your peptic ulcer. If H. pylori is the cause of your ulcer, you will take antibiotics to kill the bacteria. If your ulcer is due to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, your doctor will recommend you stop or limit your use of these drugs. For a gastric ulcer, you may be given a proton pump inhibitor also known as a PPI, to decrease acid production in your stomach. For a duodenal ulcer, you may be given a histamine type 2 receptor antagonist, commonly known as an H2 blocker, to reduce the amount of acid secreted in your stomach. In addition, your doctor may recommend medications to coat and protect the lining of your stomach and duodenum until the ulcer has healed. These include sucralfate, the nerve. Your stomach will secrete less acid. In an antrectomy, your surgeon will remove the lower part of your stomach, which is called the antrum. The antrum signals your stomach to release acid. Once it is removed, your stomach releases less acid. If your ulcer is blocking the exit of food from your stomach, your surgeon may perform a pyloroplasty. During this procedure, your surgeon will widen the pylorus, which is the opening between your stomach and duodenum, allowing food to pass through more easily. Well, there you have it. We like to give you all the necessary information that you require in order to make sure you're able to make smart health decisions. We believe in a smart, healthy lifestyle translates to smart business. Isn't that true? It does, because yes. you take care of the pennies and then the pounds will make themselves. Okay, not technically, yeah. but if you take care of yourself, you're more likely to have, succeed in, another li in your other aspects of life, such as business. So we like to give you the solutions to some of the, um, the health um, issues that we raise. We're talking about ulcers today, and this is pretty much the kind of food you should eat. Good vegetables, which you can see there. You can see some, some fresh beans. You can see some spinach. You can see some raspberries. You can see some squash. Um, you'll take asparagus. on one other asparagus as well. What other kind of food is good for you? Um, you can actually, on a more uh, drink, uh, on a drinking level, you can take milk. Mm. Warm milk uh, does the trick. So a liter of milk goes for around 3,000, depending on which brand you want. So you can take warm milk and it instant relief. It gives instant relief. Within two hours, you'll be feeling all right. So of um, course, we've seen bananas. It's also good. And also pomegranates. Pomegranates. Right? But that's yeah. quite rare in Uganda, it's I don't quite, think. Oh, they don't have them. They, they don't, don't have quite pomegranates. sell them very okay. often. So pomegranates is good. Honey is also good. Honey heals everything, I must tell you, from yeah. the skin. So I wouldn't doubt that it does a great job with the ulcers. Okay, so that's pretty much most of the health foods. Cucumbers, which is which is uh, salad, is also very good for you. Um, just remove 
get away from all everything acidic. Pomegranate juice is good. Also, stay away from oily foods. O oily foods as because well. they give a very um, rough situation in the stomach. And that is of course aloe vera. You can also take an aloe vera um, cactus plant, remove um, the, the the skin, and then boil it or drink it. Put it in water and drink it. That should be good. And of course. There you have it. Everything you green is healthy. Every, everything green and you do a smoothie, a green smoothie, should be good for, for your stomach apples. if you're suffering from uh, an ulcer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see the apples, the cauliflower, the yes. kiwi. The kiwi fruit. And you know, when you think about it, it you might think it tastes um, not pleasant, but it's, it's, it's actually all right. Okay. And then you have it, some chili. Is yeah. chili good for you? Yes. You, uh, you actually, you don't, if you don't, uh, savor the test, you swallow it with water. And also coconuts, if perhaps you leave, leave and peanuts. Co coconuts. And of course, um, ground nuts, better known as ground nuts. Yeah. yeah. Peanuts. And uh, is um, that cheese? Yes, it looks like some form of garlic or, or other. But again, you can always visit our, our Twitter page and you can get more information. And of course, ginger. Yeah. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, uh, ginger relieves everything from a headache to a sore throat, so I'm sure it does quite the job with us. Okay, on that note, we have to uh, wind up our health segment. Um, we've been talking about ulcers, various forms of ulcers, peptic ulcers. We've been talking about um, um, gastric ulcers. And we've talk been talking, of course, about the plain ulcers. And we've also been talking about the foodstuffs that you can eat that won't affect it. Things like onions, things like bananas, like warm milk. You warm said warm milk. milk yeah? yeah, that's when so, I recommend because I've seen it work. And we believe that once you're healthy, you will do good business or smart business. On that note, that wraps up our segment for health. A special thank you to everybody who's been part and parcel of this production. But before we go, we have um, Smart at Work, um, yeah. which is um, a DUI, a do-it-yourself, a young man uh, assembling a helicopter. But before we go, um, Anthea, what are your parting words? Uh, well, today we have seen farming in yeah. Israel, yeah. so I would encourage everybody to do some serious farming as we also analyze the markets much later after the yeah. farming. We, we could see that food prices are... Like, extremely high mm -hmm. so if you can farm something in your little garden with the little space you have at home remove those papers and uh, you know rile up that land and turn it into something that would be grand that would indeed be grand so on that note we're leaving you with that picture we're leaving you with that um of course you can subscribe to our youtube page when when and when we, we you see it on the screen but most importantly take a look at this a self-made helicopter and should be interesting you can make money in all types of innovative ways thank you for watching and goodbye